Hey folks, Scott Weingart here, and this is the MCrit Podcast. Today, part two of Tom DeLore on DIC and TTP. This time, we'll be discussing treatment. If you haven't already heard part one on diagnosis, you should go back and listen to that first. It was podcast 223. Before we get into it, uh, just a reminder, if you haven't already signed the Stop the SSC, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign 2018 bundle petition, then you are missing out on an opportunity. Now, if you read the bundle, which now says you have to both diagnose and start treatment on patients within one hour, not crashing patients, just these patients who you don't even necessarily know they're that sick, uh, even for hours into their course. If you agree with it, then by all means, don't sign. But if you look at that bundle and you're like, oh my God, this is going to destroy my ED, and you don't sign, then from this point forward, you have no right to ever complain about the bundle when it surely becomes regulatory demands on your ED. Because that is the natural progression of these things as they go from being a surviving sepsis campaign bundle to an NQF thing to then a CMS core measure. And if you think that's a great idea, fine. But if you don't, then you better go sign the petition. MCRIT.org slash SSC petition. One word. MCRIT.org slash SSC petition. One word. Go do it now. All right. Let's talk about TTP and DIC and how to actually treat them with Tom DeLore. This is from the Essentials of MCRIT. If you want the whole conference day, the folks at Essentials are still selling it. I get mo no money from that sale. So just go on, go on over there because it's great information. You can get it at emcrit.com or just go to Essentials of EM and you'll find it there. Wait till you hear me speak, then you won't be clapping. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I do agree, uh, being from Oregon, there probably is too much gluten in the world, but um, what we're gonna speak on is part two of DIC and TTP, the sequel. And um, as you recall, TTP is a disease of platelet aggregation. <clears throat> we're missing Adam's TS13, and it's a disease. It's the primary problem. Conversely, DIC is excess thrombin generation, overactive coagulation, and almost always due to something else, like maybe eating too much gluten. So, so how do we treat these? The key to treating TTP is plasma exchange. Randomized clinical trials have shown people benefit. And I always like this, because TTP is a rare disease. And I always hear these people like, oh, we can't do a clinical trial of that. It's a rare disease. And I'm like, they did one in TTP. Ooh. Anyway, so, um, so it's key to do. And plasma exchange probably does several things. The scientific basis of plasma exchange is really two principles. One, you remove evil humors. And secondly, you put good humors in. So, and that really makes a lot of sense in TTP. There's often inhibitors uh, to Adam's TS13. So part of the logic is you're removing these antibodies, you're removing inhibitors of Adam's TS13. But it's a very effective way of giving a lot of fluid. I really can't give more than five or six units of plasma to a person during a day. With plasma exchange, I can give them 13 to 14. So you give back a lot of Adam's TS13. So it's a very effective procedure. TTP untreated probably has a mortality of 90 to 100%. And using plasma exchange dramatically reduces it to 20% or less. So it's a very, very effective procedure. And so, what we do is uh, just, as we would say, exchange a volume and a half and then do that uh, for about five days until the patient gets better. Sometimes you have to do it a very long time. My course record, again, part of it was every other day, was doing it for several months. But it is the key to treating the patient. But you really need two things. One, your facility needs to do it. And especially when I first started at Oregon, we're the only place in the state that did it. And again, it's a big state and you had to talk a lot of people through things. The other thing is you need a big line. Phoresis is like, requires a dialysis catheter. So you need to be able to put a big ass line into the patient. And sometimes that can take time. Sometimes people are scared, ooh, the platelets are really low. But you need those two things to be able to do it and putting in a big line. So it takes some coordination. Now, what do you do if you're waiting? Um, again, I have phoresis available, but you gotta call the techs in, you gotta order the plasma, uh, you gotta get the line in. There's things you can do while you're waiting to get the patient uh, more stable. 
One is simply giving FFP. FFP provides good Adams TS13. Uh, it helps slow down the uh, spontaneous platelet aggregation. It, it can be an effective temporary therapy. And in fact, there's some older data that FFP alone was good, but obviously we need to do plasmapheresis. So I will start FFP as soon as I suspect somebody has TTP. If I'm on the consult line, somebody in Burns, Oregon, which is several hundred miles away, is gonna send somebody with the diagnosed TTP. I tell them to give a couple of units of plasma right on the bat and give them sort of a plasma drip or plasma infusion of one unit every six hours. That's enough to kind of get the ball rolling. It's not curative, but it's a very effective temporary therapy. Secondly, steroids. Sort of a running joke in hematology, there's no heme disease that is not treated with steroids, but this is also effective. Uh, most patients who have TTP, it's actually autoimmune based. Steroids can be effective. Even if it's some other rare cause of TTP, it can't hurt. So we often give steroids. So while I'm getting the patient ready, uh, while they need a line put in, again, if they need to be sent from somewhere else, you need to kind of temporize the patient to send them off to a place that has phoresis, FFP and steroids can be very effective. Now, in the future, we're developing medicines to actually unaggregate the platelets. There's an exciting nanodrug that's being studied that actually interferes with platelet aggregation and has a significant advantage in outcome. But that's not here yet. So it's still basically washing the blood, the Keith Richards approach to things. Um, one thing to remember about TTP is there's this, this great temptation to give platelets. You know, you're, you're, you know, you want to put in a line, but the platelets are 5,000. It goes against everything you've been taught, but never give a patient with TTP platelets. There's a lot of data that platelets will actually make things worse. They can spontaneously aggregate. You're just literally <clears throat> feeding the fire in this situation. So hold off the platelets no matter what. I probably have taken care of hundreds of cases of TTP. I've given exactly platelets once to somebody who was having a fatal intracranial hemorrhage. Most of these patients surprisingly don't bleed. They're actually hypercoagulable, even with the low platelet count. And all you'll do is make things worse. So put it, have the most experienced person put in the line, put in femorally so you can have direct pressure but really resist that urge to give platelets in this situation. It will do bad things. So DIC, that's pretty simple. Treat the primary cause. You know, I always think that's like the worst advice you could possibly give to somebody. You know, Scott asked me, Tom, I got this guy with sepsis. How do I treat his DIC? And I'm like, I would give him antibiotics. Oh, I never thought of that. Boy, oh gosh, you're such a genius. Uh, why don't you go away? Um, so obviously treating the primary cause is key, but usually most people have figured that out by the time I see the patient. So the other key therapy is you need to support coagulation because these patients are bleeding. And so here there used to be this myth of feeding the fire. Oh, don't give fibrinogen to people DIC, you just feed the fire. The problem is you need a fire to feed. If somebody's going to bleed to death and die, that you know, isn't a victory. And so really the feed the fire myth here has been put to rest. They're bleeding, you got to support their coagulation. If you need to do a procedure, you got to support their coagulation. So in DIC, a lot of it's coagulation support. And what I like to use is something I learned a long time ago called the magic five. These are kind of based on five tests of, uh, uh, to me, bleeding, hemodynamic stability, coagulation stability. And I kind of like the paradigm because it's useful for DIC. It's useful when you're kind of mopping up after the empiric uh, therapy of transfusion. You know, it might even work if somebody comes in the hospital with Ebola, but I'm doing that consult by telephone. Um, I think it's kind of a general paradigm. One is keep the fibrinogen up. Again, I talked earlier how it's really key. Uh, it's key for forming clot strength. If somebody's bleeding or they're having that bad DIC, they have low fibrinogen, it's a key factor. And I like to keep that above 150. We use a product called cryoprecipitate, usually 10 units of that, to bring up the fibrinogen. There's recombinant fibrinogen concentrate out there. Uh, it's a lot more expensive and doesn't seem to have any big benefits, so I stick with cryoprecipitate. 
In OB disasters, uh, like we saw earlier, uh, what we can do is it needs to be even higher. There's actually data for 200. So keep the fibrinogen up. That's one of the tests I really aim for. And again, people tend to forget fibrinogen levels, and that's why I like to check it. Secondly, platelets. You need a lot of platelets if somebody is bleeding. There's old studies from actually uh, Harborview Hospital in Seattle in the 60s and 70s that really demonstrate for somebody bleeding coagulopathic, you need the platelets above 50,000 to form that platelet plug. So if somebody's bleeding, they got DIC, uh, I'm worried about them, I will transfuse platelets and keep it above 50,000 to help stop the bleeding. And I think these are the two key steps that I think are essential. Thirdly, we're not gonna argue transfusion triggers here. Uh, unless they're massively exsanguinating, don't get too carried away with transfusions. And again, as we heard earlier, with sources of bleeding, we're getting away from over-resuscitation. But again, don't go too crazy. But again, if somebody, you know, is Grandma Perkins and has a uh, matacrit of 14, would probably benefit from a little blood. Coagulation parameters are less well-defined, again, from some of these studies that were done in Seattle. I aim for a PTT under 1.5 times control. You know, I don't aim for normality. You know, I want it in the ballpark. And here's why I use plasma. And probably in this situation, plasma is doing several things. Obviously, you're replacing the coagulation factors, and that's key. But you're also probably, you're also certainly giving back other things. You're giving back inhibitors of fibrinolysis, inhibitors of coagulation. So you're trying to restore the hemostatic balance. And again, we don't really have good measures of coagulation unless you're lucky enough to have a TAG or something. And so we often have to use these labs. And again, I try to get the PTT uh, under 1.5 times control kind of gently bring things back down. Uh, the INR is the same thing. The INR is really a terrible lab test, and very slightly high INRs are very common. Uh, in fact, we lose the INR is most dependent on a blood clotting factor called factor seven. It's actually studies in ICU patients and just being sick, you lose your factor seven. So I never break a sweat when I see a sick patient, the INR of 1.5 or even two. So when I'm, I don't try to chase INRs. When I do, I chase very high ones. And again, I give a couple units of plasma. So this is why I like these lab tests. If I get these five lab tests, which most labs should be able to turn around pretty quickly, you're gonna get a very good handle on how hemostatic the patient is. In fact, at our institution, this comes as a lab panel we call the trauma coag panel, where we can get these five tests turned around very rapidly. And again, it's helpful because people tend to forget about the fibrinogen and its important role in both supporting hemostasis, supporting laboratory tests, and remember, keep the platelets up. Those are probably the biggest things to chase. Everybody gets worried, oh, the PTT is 98, but it's really the big issue is the fibrinogen's 98, and that needs to be raised. Now, the other question I always get is, Tom, this is a disease of too much thrombin. We have drugs to inhibit thrombin. We have heparin. We have all these fancy pants new anticoagulants you're trying to get us to use. Why don't we do that? While it's intuitively a great idea to give anticoagulants, the studies on it have been basically a disaster. And I think that's because when DIC gets out of control enough that you need to treat it, there's a lot more going on than just thrombin generation. You have secondary fibrinolysis, you have thrombocytopenia, and the heparin just creates a bleeding disaster. Um, again, there's been the same sad story with antithrombin. Antithrombin concentrates are great. If you give them first, then the patient gets sick. I don't know about your patients. My patients usually don't call me up and tell me they're going to be septic tomorrow, that I can treat them. That hasn't panned out. We know the sorry activated protein C story. So unfortunately, trying to treat coagulation, trying to be more elegant has not worked. I only use heparin if there's macrothrombosis. And you usually see this in the cancer patient with DIC. Their platelets are 20, their fibrinogen's low, and they have a massive pulmonary embolism. And you kind of give everything, including the heparin but I really otherwise don't use heparin for DIC. The other issue that comes up is transexamic acid. I love transexamic acid. I have a few pills with it in my pocket just in case. I'm a big fan of it. But think about our pathophysiology of out of control DIC. We have excess thrombin generation and secondary excess fibrinolysis. What's gonna happen if we block that secondary fibrinolysis with transexamic acid? 
You're right, boing, Gumby. And so it's probably the only situation I really pause in using transexamic acid is out of control DIC uh, because you can get a prothrombotic state. So again, this treatment of DIC is really the primary cause and working aggressively on breakdown of coagulation factors, trying to support hemostasis until the patient gets better. So the key is TTP, you got to think about it. Just it always has to be in the back of your mind. Gosh, could this patient have TTP? Because if you don't think about it, you'll never catch it. High LDH should be a red flag. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, plasma exchange is the treatment of choice. To temporize, give plasma. DIC is simply thrombin and coagulation out of control. Uh, we look for deranged laboratory tests, always secondary to something else. We treat the primary cause, and then what we do is uh, we mop up, we keep the patient intact by supporting coagulation. And I will stop there, and again, just another uh, thanks to everybody for inviting me to this truly wonderful conference. <laughs> Man. That's amazing. I think you're going to lose your hematologist card. You're too easy to understand. Um, so let's go through this. So patient, you strongly suspect of TTP because they're sick yes. and their platelets are low and their LDH is high and they have schistocytes on their peripheral smear. Yes. And you're in a place, you're at a community shop, so you don't have plasma freezes. So the first thing you're going to do is give how much FFP? I like to bolus with two units and then after that, give about another unit every six hours. All right, and hopefully the patient will have left your shop right, by then right. because you want to send them somewhere right. that has it. Yeah, get them stabilized and then get on the phone to who does plasma exchange. You're going to give them steroids because there's probably little harm and there may be right. a lot of benefit. Correct. Which steroid and what dose? You know, it's arbitrary like most things hematology. Uh, I use 60 milligrams. Of, I Don't quote me on that. Uh, I use 60 milligrams of prednisone. Some of my colleagues use 125 methylprednisolone. It's arbitrary, but a buttload of steroids. But low dose, not the crazy. Yeah, not, not crazy grams. All right. Now, when I first had, because I've always worked at referral centers, when I had my first patient with TTP and they're like, yeah, we want to plasma freeze the patient, but you have to put in the line. And I looked at their platelets of like 6,000 and I'm like, oh crap. But since having seen a lot of these patients, they never bleed. Correct. They never bleed with this line. Like everyone's petrified, <laughs> but it's, it's safe, correct? It is absolutely safe. Yeah. Uh, no, so uh, that's good. You got overactive platelets. And anyway, an experienced person put in a line has a low risk of bleeding anyway. So no, I, I never hesitate. If my colleagues give me a trouble, then I do the chicken dance around them, and that just shames them. Now, now, Tom mentioned going femoral. That's a safe choice <laughs> if you go low. You don't want to go super high on the femoral because then you could get into retroperitoneal bleed. So if you stay low, you're safe. Or... IJ, because the worst that happens with an IJ is they get intubated. And after that, it's a totally compressible site. Subclavian, I'd stay away from that, even though they don't bleed. Okay, so that's TTP. Yes. Seems relatively good in my mind. DIC, oh, and what we should say on TTP is that actually the feeding the fire is a truth there. You there, don't want to give the There is a truth. Yep. There is the truth. There is a fire to feed and it'll kill the patient. All right, so no there is no indication for platelets unless they had, I don't know, a bleed that was life-threatening from... It could even be separate from the TTP, yeah, yeah. but they have concomitant TTP. The, the only time I gave was some guy fell, cracked his head, and was having a massive intracranial hemorrhage. There you go. So the trauma yes. was concomitant. Right. The TTP did not yeah. cause the head bleed. All right. Now, DIC, on the other hand, there is no feeding the fire. No. you got to feed the fire there. And so you're going to be giving these folks a lot yeah. of product using your big five to guide you. Yes. So let's go through it. So check, because most people are forgetting. So actually mm. check the fibrinogen. Yes, key. And when it gets less than 150 or 200 in a pregnant patient, yes. then give Cryo. Cryo precipitate. And you give that in a 10 unit pack. Right, a 10 pack. And let's say you were at a wealthy hospital, they just want to burn through money, and they had fibrinogen concentrate. Would you use it if it was there, or it's not even worth it? I don't think it's worth it because cryo precipitate also has von Willebrand's factor, has factor eight, fibronectin. So I would still go with the tried and true. All right, so there's your fibrinogen, your platelet transfusion yes. trigger. You want it higher than just the 10,000 where, like we talk about, right. in, like an ITP page. Yeah. Because I worry there, there's ongoing bleeding, you want to staunch that, and then you need a higher platelet count to do it. Now, the question comes up, let's say you have somebody who's got DIC, but they're not bleeding for some reason, you just check the labs. Some people would say 20,000 in that situation, but they're bleeding, you want to stop the bleeding, you need 50,000. All right, there you go, and just transfuse as much platelet yes. as it takes to get there. Same transfusion trigger as pretty much everything else for blood, Yes, 7 and 21. 
Correct. And then your PTT, since it varies by lab, you're saying less than 1.5 times normal, Contr right. whatever your lab's normal is. And then the, the INR, it's not a great measure of anything, right. but, and the treatment for the PTT probably will. We'll take care of the IR. All right, is there anything else we should know about DIC that we haven't touched on? I think we've touched on everything. Tom, oh, you're- Oh, a, this is a blast. You're an great. amazing, amazing great. person. Great. Thank you great. so Thank much. Thank you very much.